Great. Um, so this is uh, Jake Bobeck with CBRE. And uh, uh, on behalf of CBRE, we're proud to sponsor this um, uh, third episode uh, of our webinar series uh, with Open Path. And, um, you know, the, the, the first, we're kind of making some progress here. Uh, the, the first webinar we had two weeks ago, for those of you uh, who attended, those of you who didn't, we can, uh, we have a link to the recording, but was really surviving um, getting your workforce up and working mobily as quickly as possible. Um, we moved on last week to, you know, really kind of stabilizing the workplace from a mobile perspective. Uh, and this week, you know, we're really focused on, on thriving um, in a time of surviving and, and uh, what we're going to talk about today or, or some of the survival tactics, um, opportun opportunities to uh, reduce real estate costs, you know, really all from a workplace perspective. Um, so thank you guys for joining. We're, or, or folks for joining. We're, we're happy you're here. Um, I want to make quick introductions for our, uh, our speakers today. Uh, first, uh, Scott Stuber, uh, Senior Vice President uh, with CBRE, uh, is an office leasing specialist based at the firm's down, uh, headquarters in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, Scott focuses on a range of different companies and industries ranging from large public global occupiers to venture funded uh, occupiers uh, through greater Los Angeles. Uh, Scott assists clients with their local, national, and international leases, sales, financing, and construction projects uh, for all types of assets. Um, and so we're glad to have Scott on here. Um, James, uh, James Siegel is a serial entrepreneur and president of Open Path. Uh, James has built and sold three successful technology companies over the past 17 years. Um, James' experience uh, uh, in his role with Open Path, uh, he's well versed in uh, addressing trials and tribulations business encounter, especially when it comes to human capital and their technology needs. Uh, James received the 2014 Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award um, and uh, has been building his company Open Path for the last few years. Um, so we're glad to have uh, both of you here as panelists. And um, I think James, I want to turn it over. Oh, one, one other thing. Um, we're going to have live questions here. So if you look to the bottom of the screen here, there's uh, an app called Mentee. So if you could download that uh, as you go, any questions you have, uh, feel free to type those in. Uh, we will address those at the end of the webinar uh, in real time. And then also uh, uh, James and Scott's contact information is at the back of this. Any questions that you may have um, uh, post the, uh, the webinar, feel free to follow up with them, with them directly. Um, and uh, thanks for joining, James. I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thanks, Jake. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, obviously, uh, this is a, uh, a time uh, with a lot of fluidity and flux going on. And we, uh, uh, both on the CBRE and the Open Path side, have been getting a ton of questions from our clients uh, across the U.S. about um, what do they need to think about, what do they need to do to both reduce uh, cost infrastructure as their business is changing, they're not at work in their offices, they're working remotely, and what do they need to do to think about uh, the future as they start to think about their staffing and the nature of work uh, moving forward. And the real estate footprint is, I think, uh, an area where both, uh, you know, CBRE and Open Path uh, have a lot of expertise. So what we are going to talk about today are um, a little bit around, you know, what are the occupancy needs that you have uh, as you emerge from this period of time where everything is in flux and has changed? Um, what does the physical footprint that you need look like? What are the tools? What are the skills that you need to have? And then importantly, what are the questions to ask? Uh, and then what is the new normal? What does social distancing at work look like? What are things to think about in terms of the office space and how you structure that, uh, whether it's you know shifts or hours or people or, or, or furniture even? Uh, and then how do you make sure uh, from a cost perspective, you don't lose some of the most valuable assets you have, which are your people? Uh, and then finally, uh, really about what technology can you leverage uh, to bring all of this to bear? Uh, and how does that improve the quality of your day-to-day -day experience and your costs? Uh, and so that is uh, at a high level, um, you know, what we're going to talk about today, then we'll have time for question and answer. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, what I wanted to try to do was give uh, folks a framework to think about uh, from a timing perspective. Uh, and so I'll say uh, in advance, maybe this is a little controversial, but what, what we've been doing is speaking to as many experts as we can, uh, whether it's epidemiologists uh, for large pharma and biomedical companies, 
whether it's public policy experts uh, or our clients, uh, occupiers, landlords, uh, across the entire landscape. There's a general um, approach to the timing of this that we all need to consider. Right now, we're in a triage mode, right? We're making sure that our staff, our people, our family, our friends are alive and healthy. We're flattening the curve. So we are in that first phase one. We are looking to uh, stay at home. We're looking to stop interaction publicly, and we wanna make sure that we flatten the curve as this disease spreads. Um, but what does that mean as we think of the next uh, steps in terms of our behavior? Well, the next phase after this is, is once this, this first phase is done and the curve has been flattened a bit, there's going to be this period of time pre-vaccine where medical treatments are going to come out and people are going to be able to mitigate the symptoms of the disease. And, and there's going to be a, a desire both for people emotionally to interact more publicly. There's going to be a policy and public, you know, uh, you know, policy decisions that are made to allow uh, more commerce and people to get out. And that's going to come in waves. Uh, we're going to kind of go in and out. Uh, and um, maybe it lasts months, maybe it lasts weeks. Uh, we don't really know. Uh, and, and that's a period of time and change where we need to be ready with our office footprint to accommodate people coming back into the workplace in a way that's going to involve social distancing. Uh, we then have a period of time when a vaccine comes out and we start to distribute that vaccine nationwide. And that means that we're trying to build herd immunity, which is great. That gets us to a place where people have had this and can now have antibodies built up or you know there's a vaccine that comes out which allows them to not get it uh, and that needs to get uh, sort of well distributed and there's a period of time where there's going to be a sensitivity also to how we you know interact in the workspace and then finally there's kind of what the new normal is which is a little bit like what happened when we went through a time of period after uh, any major uh, event right whether it was a terrorist event or a, a disease event or an economic event where we adjust to a new normal that takes into account what can happen in the future if another pandemic happens and how do we best prepare and set ourselves up for that. So this is kind of the framework we wanted to offer to uh, all of you today to sort of think about the various puts and takes associated with this. Uh, by no means is this gospel, and this can be a time frame that you come up with on your own, but we wanted to at least give you a starting point as we think about the various steps that we're gonna take. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'll hand it back to Scott to uh, start to take us through some of the cost-cutting measures we might think about. Thanks, James. N now we're going to get into kind of the meat of the discussion here. Um, of the five cost-cutting steps that we can uh, hopefully help you prepare your business for immediately, uh, we're going we're gonna to break them down into kind of a short-term and a long-term um, silo. Uh, so that you can focus on the short term, but be mindful of the long term while you're focusing on the short term. The first item here is determining your new occupancy needs. Uh, and, and what we always try to recommend to our clients is to do that using data. Uh, and so when you look at the short term breakdown here, uh, the first thing that you obviously have to factor and consider is that there are probably some changes in, in your headcount going on right now. Um, and and uh, I'm, not, I'm not taking that lightly, and obviously no one is, and, and I know it's impacting businesses and individuals across the country and globally right now, um, but it's a fact. And so we got to take that fact and see how that's actually going to impact your, your current status quo. Are you reducing your headcount? Are you outsourcing some headcount? What is going on with respect to that and getting your arms around that? Uh, the second item of data that can be helpful in understanding your new occupancy needs moving forward is actually looking back at the past. Um, a lot of our clients right now are looking at um, historical log access data, whether it's through parking garage access, whether it's through uh, building uh, key card access or facil uh, a premises key card access. Who was actually coming into the space and when were they coming into the space and how can you then take that and look at the third bullet here, which is, which is understanding from your department heads, what the nuances, the true nuances are with respect to department needs. So basically, uh, find the intersection of the data of who had been coming into the space, looking at your new data of what your headcount impacts are gonna be, and bringing together the guidance and observations from your expert department heads to determine how this may impact your workplace strategies moving forward. And then that's kind of the final bullet in this topic is taking a look at 
based on historical, based on current, and based on contemplations of what is your business travel needs going to look like for your employees moving forward? I got to think that business travel is going to cut back. What is your sick day policy moving forward? And we'll get into that later in the, in the presentation, but probably going to have to enforce more stringent sick, sick day policies where if someone has a sniffles where they feel good enough to work, but perhaps um, can't come into the office, you're going to have to come up with a remote working setting to support that new system. So how does all of that actually impact your needs of having employees in your space any given day? And then how does that translate into reduced footprint? Now, longer term, the topic goes from what most of you are dealing with right now with respect to business continuity and being forced to shift people remote because they can't get into the office. Longer term, it's actually going to look at more of the, the topic of how, how and who is actually eligible for working remote. So beyond kind of the forced needs of working remotely, which is business continuity and sick and travel, how are you actually potentially as a business long-term going to be able to become more efficient and mindful of who can work from home and why are they then able to work from home? And you can start looking at some of these questions here now. We'll be sending this as a follow-up for you to work through based on tenure and suitability of the employees and potentially job responsibilities. What tasks are they performing? What's their demographic breakdown? Are they more suitable to having kind of at home focused work or do they actually need to be collaborative? And if they are collaborative, can that collaboration occur over a Zoom call? Does it need to be in person? Um, what time zones are they working towards? Are they working in global or are they more working local? Uh, so these are some of the questions that you can start working through now or, or just be observant of as you start unfolding your longer term strategy. So as you start getting your arms around some of this data and start contemplating on some potential future workplace strategies uh, and start answering some of those long term questions, uh, the, the next kind of step is, OK, what can we do right now to adjust our footprint in an effort to cut costs? Um, and, and what we're starting to talk to a lot of our clients about right now is, do we need all the space that we're current, currently sitting in? Some of our clients are coming to us and saying, gosh, remote working actually is working for our customer care unit. We probably don't need them to be commuting an hour, an hour and a half into the office anymore. So now we're contemplating just shifting our, our, our employees to 100% work from home, or we're contemplating uh, operating multiple shifts. And, and, and some of the decisions coming out of that are instantly putting space right now on the sublease market if their space can demise in a way that works for them to be able to do that. Uh, another contemplation is depending on your remaining lease term, if it's, if it's a shorter term and you see validity and potentially exploring an extension and you have more clarity in what your needs are based on some of the prior changes that you've uh, 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 um, encountered with respect to establishing your new occupancy needs. There are some discussions right now that landlords are open to where they can potentially trade footprint size for term length. And those are just kind of a couple of the levers that you can kind of pull and push on in order to evaluate whether right now you can weave in immediate rent abatement or right now you can reduce your occupancy costs in exchange for committing to something else that actually gives value to the landlord in this time of uncertainty. Now, when you're doing these kind of short-term reaction, somewhat reactionary moves, um, although the questions we outlined in one hopefully allow you to be very strategic here, you want to make sure that you're focused on the long-term scenario. And, and some of the long-term questions that you can be contemplating here, one is how do these immediate decisions allow for flexibility to accommodate future headcount needs? So if in looking at James's framework that he kicked this off with, what does the new normal look like for your headcount? You kind of know what's happening now, right, with staff adjustments. You might have kind of a, a guess of what's going to unfold as the vaccine comes through. But what will the new normal look like? And will that, will that hit during our remaining lease term or the lease term that you're committing to? And will your committed lease term accommodate forecasted headcount growth as we bump out of here? And can you incorporate some flexible lease terms to allow you to accordion grow based on how you might ebb and flow? Because the last thing you want to do right now 
is cut off too much space in order to accommodate the, the, the uh, reduction in occupancy expense, then for example, learn that you can recover some of your forecasted expenses through the CARES Act, and then all of a sudden you're able to hire in order to um, uh, react to the rebound that may occur, and then all of a sudden you're hamstrung because you, you, you tightened up your real estate too much. So how can you then weave in flexible lease terms to allow you to then ebb and flow based on potential adjustments? Because none of what we're talking about with respect to James's framework, as he mentioned, there's no certainty at all to that right now, especially from a timeline standpoint. So the key here is establishing flexibility. We also don't know how workstations are going to really going to be monitored moving forward. You know, do you, do you need more space for workstations in order to accommodate social distancing within the workplace? Or, or did you have them as they were too big because now you're going to need less people within your workplace because you're going to be able to accommodate more remote working solutions? Are conference rooms too small or too big you know, to kind of accommodate the new social distancing? Are, are there going to be more people or not that work from home? So there could be a scenario actually where you do reduce your headcount need in your workplace, but then the anticipated and expected reduction in footprint is actually offset by the need to create more distance in the workstations or create larger conference rooms in order to allow for space in communal gatherings. So the next step, right, as we're kind of going along this, this um, path of progression is what can you do right now, right? What can you actually do with the state of our current condition and our emergency situation that is uh, being implemented in many of our municipalities? One thing that we're starting to evaluate right now for clients is, is looking at your footprint with the data that they uncover, number one, with the assumptions that are made for number two, and actually working on preliminary layouts. Uh, we have a floor technology that you can do this and manipulate this online with the help of an architect. Um, but basically, take your floor plan, apply your new assumptions with respect to your workplace count, apply your new assumptions with respect to expanding conference rooms, and see whether your footprint actually still accommodates your need. If you have extra cushion and fluff, do you want to keep that in order to accommodate the flexible needs that I outlined before? Or are you willing and able to actually put a demising wall up to attempt to sublease that space? And what we're starting to notice now with the ability to do virtual tours, these are starting to hit the market this week. Some subleases of just cutting back space, taking pieces of it off, or even putting all of it on the market, depending on what the remaining lease term is. So a lot of our clients that have a short remaining lease term and they have a feeling that that might actually be a period that they can continue to work from home and they then want to kind of use that time to determine what their future need is, they're actually contemplating putting all their space on the sublease market for the remaining term to see if there's anyone out there right now that's willing to take it. And because there is uncertainty on that demand, it, it's really a situation where the first mover uh, wins in this situation. Uh, so James, I'd like you to take um, the next bullet here, which starts tapping into some of the more kind of technology, access credentials, mobile door openers, since that is really kind of your core line of business. Yeah, and, and I think um, one of the challenges that we've run into uh, with a lot of our folks is regardless of whether or not they're going to use the same footprint that they have, or whether they're going to subdivide, uh, sublet, uh, or reshape, uh, they're really thinking about the influence and the impact of social distancing. So. Uh, number one is what do we do about common surfaces? So, uh, you know, there's a coffee machine, there's a water cooler, uh, there's hoteling or, um, you know, um, basically uh, free addressing where people have been sharing workspaces before. And there's going to be a reluctance, I think, both from people emotionally to want to um, not spread germs and not basically touch common surfaces, as well as from a, a policy perspective, uh, I think you're going to see some uh, policy coming out both on a, a, a city, state, uh, and federal level on how many people uh, from an occupancy perspective can actually be in a, a space and then what is your obligation as the occupier of that space and or the, the building owner uh, to be able to track that and mitigate the impact of people being so close. So uh, I think reducing the number of common surfaces that are touched by so many people as well as an aggressive cleaning uh, program and so think about automatic door openers, right? Uh, I mean, you go wash your hands in the bathroom and then you have to touch the door handle to open the door again. Uh, that's not gonna fly. Um, you know, think about the ability for people to actually, you know, get in and out 
much more easily. Uh, air as well, air circulation. So there's a lot of uh, investment in HVAC systems and uh, different sort of air filtering technology to make sure that people feel that the air quality is, is, is circulated and good. Um, I think there's a lot of shifting of hours as well. So one of the things that we've seen is that the typical schedule uh, that you put on an access uh, door for uh, various uh, work groups is changing. Uh, you might have a total maximum occupancy uh, for people in a space to be six feet away from each other at any given time, and that might cap you at 10 people in a space or 20 people in a space uh, that was otherwise really set up to have 40 or 50 people in it. And now you have to track and count the number of people who come in, uh, and you have to also think about uh, how they move around that space, and, and you're shifting the hours of access as well, so you need to change door entry schedules and people's permissions. Uh, so there's a lot of different work that has to go on on a process mapping and organizational level within your HR and different groups to manage those shifts so that people are not sort of, you know, overwhelming the space, as well as uh, your physical space layout has to adjust accordingly. And maybe that takes us, Scott, to the next slide, which is uh, there's a lot of policy work uh, that you have to do. And, and I think the main driver for this is not about efficiency. But from everything we've heard, it's about keeping the people that you have wanting to work for you, right? So think about the emotional response and reaction that people are getting. We are going to uh, invest a ton of money in people who are important to our business. We want to make sure that they are trained on the new normal. And so investing in policy creation uh, and training on how to be effective at your job will reduce the cost of people churning and basically leaving. I think there's a lot of risk right now, especially with folks who are homeschooling their kids and having to stay home uh, for many months now on how they re-enter the workplace, how they go back to their jobs. And if we want the best people to stay on board with us and not have to have recruiting fees to go hire a whole replacement uh, set of workers, uh, we're going to have to act now to train them and make sure they understand that there's a safe work environment to come back to and there's a policy and a set of processes in place to make sure that they're taken care of. There's a huge emotional component to this, aside from the actual government policies that are gonna come in. And we all wanna know that we're safe, that our employers are looking out for us and are investing in us. And, and so I'd say both short-term and long-term, uh, the right kind of policies, whether it's sick day or business continuity stuff, uh, as well as technology uh, is super important. Maybe if we go on to technology, I think, uh, there's a number of investments that you can make uh, right now uh, that will reduce your overall costs, uh, both short term and long term, and also uh, help you really get the information that you need to capture to make smart business decisions. So let's start with the idea of actually tracking and understanding who's using your space. Um, you can look back on the access logs and the information that you have, but as you look forward, how are you going to effectively manage a capacity of five people, 10 people, or 20 people in a space when there's no guard there to actually restrict access and count. Uh, so people counters that can be installed above doors really help on this. Access control systems and video surveillance systems with artificial intelligence that can monitor and track who is entering a space so that you are meeting your regulatory obligation. You're also meeting the responsibility that you have to keep fewer people in the space at the same time. Uh, so I think those kind of technology investments become really important in the short term. There's a unique moment in time that we have right now where uh, there uh, is an empty set of space that you have. So all the construction work, the upgrade work, uh, the uh, adjustment to the floor plan or the footprint uh, can happen now at no uh, discomfort to any of your workers. Uh, this might be a really good time to start to think about, okay, let's get folks in there who can actually get that work done. And um, that's what we're seeing a number of our uh, you know, clients, partners, and customers start to think about investing in. Uh, I'd also say the integration of all of your uh, sort of enterprise software that you use to run and manage your business, uh, integrating that with a lot of the physical occupancy tools is really important. So if you have an IT system where you store all of your human information, maybe your directory service like Active Directory uh, or Okta or G Suite or one of those, or your HR system, tying that to your video surveillance system, tying that to your alarm and HVAC system, tying that to your access control system so that everything it can be monitored and managed from your staff wherever they are uh, will allow you to be flexible in terms of setting schedules, shifting workers to different spaces, and using your space uh, really economically and cost effectively. So with that, um, let's see how all of this overlays back on that framework we talked about. 
Um, again, if we break up, uh, you know, the next period of time, uh, kind of during COVID and post COVID, I think uh, there's the actions that you take now to develop your real estate plan, right? Prepare your physical space and make sure that your employees are ready for what the new normal is going to be. And then we go into this period before the vaccines are distributed where we're in this adjusted normal, right? This is the kind of uh, phase two and phase three where uh, we're, we've got space that we've reconfigured. Um, we are working in that space. We have remote work. We have on-premise work and we have different shifts that are going on. And our employees are giving us feedback and we're pivoting and adjusting to that real time and reassessing what we really need. Uh, and then of course, there's what is the new normal going to be like after this when we are aware of uh, you know pandemics as a potential risk in our business and we've mitigated as best we can by making sure that we're ready to pivot to remote, that we've got technology in place, and that we've got the right real estate footprint with, to Scott's point, the flexible capabilities in our lease agreements to move around and, and move resources around as need be. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll hand it back uh, to uh, folks to sort of start to get to the Q&A and the question part. Uh, you know, Mentee is the method that you can submit questions. You can also put them in the chat bar if you need to. Uh, and Jake's gonna navigate this for us and tell us who's coming in. Uh, yeah, great. Thanks, James. Uh, great work there. Um, yeah, we've got some questions coming in, so I'm just going to throw these out uh, to you guys and, and um, uh, uh, respond accordingly. But the, the first one we have is, um, as we come out of COVID, uh, my team will most likely want to continue some aspects of work from home while wanting to have the opportunity to be together on somewhat frequent basis. Any tips on how best to plan for that? Yeah, I'll take that first, James. Um, that's, that's kind of what we anticipate here, is, is not only teammates and employees wanting to work from home, but uh, managers actually figuring out and, and validating that they can work from home. So I think it, it obviously can't be arbitrary. It obviously can't be kind of on a volunteer basis. Hey, who wants to work from home? Okay, you can. Um, it goes back in a way to our, our first uh, question here, which is figuring out kind of your new occupancy uh, solution, your new occupancy needs. You have to come up with a workplace policy. And ideally, it, it, it's based on kind of data so that you could validate that they're performing tasks that they can actually accomplish and be productive for at home, that they are suitable from kind of a personality profile standpoint to be able to get work done at home and that the tasks that they're actually performing are tasks that allow them to be individual or if they need to be collaborating that they can collaborate on video conference calls that everyone all of a sudden is becoming experts on um, so i'd start there but then what you have to kind of do from there too is is then create kind of a defined um, approach in a way kind of a company policy that allows for full transparency on what can lead to work from home eligibility. Uh, so that if you do get pushback or complaints, or if you're trying to hire someone, or someone is, you, you have some angsty employee that's upset that they are not eligible, you can then actually back that up with a policy to support it. Um, and then I think the other thing that you kind of have to do as well, and is critical, is to train your managers, to put them in a position to be effective with their remote workers. It's a different animal when you're trying to train and when you're trying to kind of monitor and mentor productivity uh, to make sure that individuals are hitting deadlines, that those deadlines are clearly communicated, to make sure that you can trust, in a way, you can trust that your employees are actually going to be getting that work done from home when you allow them to do that. So just to kind of break it down, I would first assess um, some past data on, on kind of what, what, what has happened before. Uh, then I'd kind of try to understand uh, the profile of the individuals to see if they're eligible. I'd also tap into your department heads to have a clear understanding of what tasks those individuals are working on. And then I'd make sure to put the management training in place to allow for it to be rolled out effectively and monitored effectively. That was great. I don't have much to add. So I'll let, uh, let's, uh, if there's more questions, we can. Keep yeah, going. there is. James, James, here's one for you. Uh, there's so many common services that people touch in any building. What is our responsibility as occupiers and what's the landlord's responsibility? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I think that um, it's a shared responsibility to uh, 
invest in making sure that uh, there is as germ-free an environment as possible. Um, certainly for the next period of time, whatever it is, six months or so, or give or take, right? And so uh, reducing uh, the frequency of having to touch common surfaces is I think something you need to do on your individual office suite. If you're uh, in a single tenant building, obviously it's kind of your obligation as the, uh, as the occupier. And then if you're in a multi-tenant building, I think that the landlord has an obligation on the common spaces, elevators, lobby doors, uh, public restrooms and the like to make sure that there's a way for those doors to open uh, automatically and uh, for you to not have to touch certain elevator uh, buttons and to, you know, be able to come in and out of the restrooms with uh, some level of, of automation there. Um, I think the same goes though for your offices. Uh, one of the topics that's come up a lot with uh, folks is, you know, kind of, do I share a desk with someone? Uh, because I've been sharing desks, you know, a couple of days a week, I use this desk, a couple of days a week, somebody else does. And you're now touching the same surface as that other person does. Um, and so, you know, how do you wipe it down and clean it? And is that really your obligation uh, as a person who's using office space or as an occupier who's responsible for providing that office to your employees? And I think it's a shared obligation uh, around everyone. But um, this is the time to invest in reducing as many of those touch points as possible. And then a, a, an aggressive cleaning approach, obviously, is going to help compound that. God, thanks for that. Um, Scott, one for you here. Um, how are your clients dealing with their facility needs while having to be remote? Um, I guess I could kind of take that a couple different directions. Um, so I'll answer it a couple different ways. How are they dealing with their facility needs? So I, I think what, in a way, kind of my first answer is how do you actually kind of um, allow for productivity and enable productivity from your employees while they're working remotely? And how do you uh, maintain morale? How do you maintain kind of the sense of culture while people are all individual working from home on videos and you don't have that? collaborative environment, that communal environment that humans thrive on. Um, and then I think, you know, in a way, James, it might come back to you on how you're actually monitoring your physical facility while employees are working remote. So it seems like there's almost two ways to approach that. Um, but I'd say that the key, the key, the key way that, that a lot of my clients are doing that is, is first kind of making sure that their employees are safe and healthy. Uh, and at home and, and uh, abiding by social distancing. Two is um, business continuity, right? Any projects that are in place, how do I put systems in place to make sure that those projects continue? Uh, just because we're working from home doesn't mean that the world completely stops. Um, so you know, we're, we're coaching them and advising them with the assistance of our workplace team, AC and Emily from the last couple of weeks on how to implement remote working tactics to be productive. Um, and then I think, you know, the third part is really what we're talking about today is how do you take the learnings of these new systems? How do you take the learnings of how this is actually going uh, to then unfold uh, a forward looking strategy and some action items right now on how to adjust your footprint to accommodate your future needs as a business? Yeah, one thing to add real quick is that um, we've gotten pushed back from folks uh, to actually have to send employees into the office. Uh, because they have to access the local system there in the office or do something that's only allowed to be or can be done in the office. We're reluctant to do that given that we're trying to flatten the curve and we don't want to put any of our employees at risk. Uh, I think many of our clients are experiencing that as well. Uh, what you've seen is a lot of facility related technology at least is on premise, right? And so people are having to go there even if no one's in the building to manage those systems, right? elevator systems, HVAC systems, building systems, uh, access control systems, parking, video, all those things need to be serviced and managed. And so there's a facilities team that's having to be on premise to manage that. I think this is that moment where people are waking up and saying, hey, as much of that technology as I can make available remotely, cloud-based technology, or at least web-based stuff that you can remote in via VPN, this is the moment in time when everyone's sort of having that aha saying, if only we had stuff that was, you know, cloud-based and web-based, we would not have to do this. And this is that moment, I think, where we can think about investing in that. Jake, you there? Are you frozen?
Yeah. Looks like we lost. Looks like we lost Jake. Uh, there uh, you I'm back. Sorry about that, guys. Hey, so uh, I have two questions. I'm going to drop into one. Um, James, I think we have one of your customers on here, but we have an open uh, open path access control system at our offices. If we subdivide any of our space or sublet it to another company, do we have to pull out the access control system as well, or can you guys uh, let us partition the system? And then the second part to that, Scott, is, hey, if can can folks even get into the building to 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 subdivide the space? Um, so James, I'll let you answer the question on uh, being able to subdivide your system, and then Scott, if you can address actually getting into physically subdivide your space. Yeah. Uh, so the short answer is, yeah, uh, you can do that. Uh, so we actually have that as one of our business cases because we have uh, a lot of landlords who use our systems and they can create kind of parent and child accounts. And so that way you don't actually have to pull a system out necessarily. You can basically keep the readers on the door uh, and you can issue new credentials to your sublet tenant and you can basically act as a landlord where they have their own discrete system. It's not tied into any of your stuff. The data is stored separately. There's no uh, cybersecurity uh, risk. There's no physical security risk. And it's kind of a, an amenity that you can actually use to reposition that subletted space as differentiated with uh, you know, this you know, mobile enabled, cloud enabled uh, access control. Uh, and I know that, uh, you know, Scott, as you start to answer that next question, we have more than 600 system integration partners nationwide that are uh, all deemed essential. And they are right now uh, literally rolling trucks out to buildings doing work. And so I think that, uh, in, you know, even though certain markets are shut down, uh, electrical work and certain work is considered essential. I'm not sure about the rest of all the stuff, though. Uh, and so you probably have better insight into what's possible these days. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that quickly. I think, you know, this is all again, real time, right? So my answer yesterday is different than it is today. Um, but we are seeing it's, it's on a, uh, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, municipality, municipality by municipality uh, basis. So for example, just, just yesterday afternoon, uh, I got an e email from, uh, Hank Warner who runs our project management group here in LA and is kind of uh, dialed into kind of real-time updates uh, on accessibility, not just by, um, you know, individuals, but also by contractors and architects and uh, all the service providers that are uh, allowing for the completion of construction, whether it's ground up or TIs. And it's still authorized by you know, the city of LA. So Mayor Garcetti sent around this notice, but it, it's, it's authorized as long as the individuals are abiding by uh, a strict set of guidelines. Uh, so I'm uh, happy to share those. I won't go through those right now, but basically it involves and requires that they maintain six feet distancing from their, um, from the other contractors on the site. Uh, it makes sure that they have been trained in um, kind of COVID exposure control, make sure that they have a COVID exposure uh, control plan. And it, it's also um, requiring that the city of LA inspectors are constantly rolling through different sites every day to verify that the workers are actually abiding by these guidelines and rules at the risk of being shut down. So right now and today, projects are still open and moving forward. All right, I'm gonna ask uh, one more question and then we'll wrap up here. Um, Scott, I think uh, this question to you is, um, uh, and, and maybe a little bit of the elephant in the room on the subletting topic, but how worried should should office tenants be about uh, timing here on subletting uh, subletting their space? What does demand and supply look like right now uh, in various markets? Good question. Um, I think and we've got about two minutes, and then we'll wrap. How worried should you be depends on how positive a person you can be. Um, you know, there, there's a range of reactions that we're seeing right now, right? There's the individuals that, um, you know, are, are waiting for more clarity and waiting for more of this dust to settle, waiting for more of the uncertainty to, to pass, waiting for more clarity on uh, what's going to unfold with the CARES Act, whether they qualify for payroll protection. Uh, waiting for clarity on accounts receivables starting to roll in more so than they have over the last couple of weeks, uh, waiting for clarity on um, how they are going to um, move forward with an occupancy plan and therefore what their physical footprint looks like when we move to phase two, three, and the new normal as James outlined. So there's a lot of questions there, but all I can say is, you know, 
we're, we're seeing a handful of our clients and a lot of them, you start to have these questions and actually start to act and to start to put some sublease space on the market. So in as much as you have clarity, every business is unique, uh, where you sit in a company life cycle, where you sit kind of within an industry, uh, every, every user is unique, but as much as you have clarity and certainty that your footprint can be and will be reduced, uh, we're, we're starting to put those spaces on the sublease market through virtual tours that we have an individual go into the space, uh, ideally accessing it through open pass technology as a visitor so that no one else has to, has to meet them there. They go and visit the space. They, they prepare a video for us. They edit it. It ends up being one minute long and we post it on a, a publicly available channel that we then market to those users out there that have certainty and clarity that they will need space whether they're moving out of another uh, location that their lease is expiring during the span of time right now that we're sitting in this work from home mindset, or whether they've determined that their current space just doesn't work for them anymore because the occupancy plan that they've developed leads them to needing a different kind of space. A lot of them are looking at some short-term subleases. So the amount of that demand though, we don't know what that's going to look like. So we're encouraging as much as you have clarity and certainty on what you're unfolding needs will be and that allows you then to kind of break off a portion of your space to sublease put it on the market and, and get it into the consideration set for the other tenants on the demand side that also have visibility to their needs all right and then just just one more short question here because i think this is the best one that we've received really in the three weeks of our um, of our webinar series here uh, but this question just in uh, where do james and scott buy their shirts <laughs> I just have you know that uh, this is the first time I've seen Scott showered and uh, dressed <laughs> in the last week of preparing for all these things. So I'm just excited that uh, he actually put on his, his is that, I, yeah, that's his bar mitzvah shirt. That's great. <laughs> uh, I've had mine as long. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll, we'll, uh, so in, in, if there's anything else, if there's anything else you guys have to say, let me know. Otherwise we'll wrap this. We want to, we want to thank everybody for joining, uh, wish everyone, uh, 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 to be safe and, and well out there in, in challenging times. And uh, any questions for uh, uh, James and Scott that you didn't get answered, feel free to uh, to email them. Uh, they are sitting in their house. They actually have, uh, uh, they're sitting in their underwear below those shirts. So they're waiting to answer your questions. Um, but thanks everybody for joining in. <laughs> Good luck, everyone. Please stay positive and let us know if we can provide any other help. Thanks everybody.